Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Memorial United Methodist Church's uh, online worship service. Though we are practicing safe social distancing today, we are going to continue to worship God together, and we are so thankful that we have the technology in place to be able to do that. So thank you for tuning in to worship with us. We are glad that you are here. Please, please help us record the, uh, your participation in our worship today and you'll find a link in the description to this live feed that you can do that on or you will receive it in our Just Three Things email later on today. And if you could take a moment to find that document and fill it in so that we can record your participation, we would be really thankful for that. With our most vulnerable church members and community members in mind, we have cancelled all of our church-based events here this week. And if you have specific questions about your small groups or your classes, then I want to invite you to get in touch with your small group or class leader, and they will let you know what your specific plans are for that. Things are very fluid right now all around us. You know that as well as I do. Our pastors and our church staff will meet tomorrow morning and we'll put plans in place for the next couple of weeks ahead and we will communicate that with you as soon as we can. So if you have not signed up for our e-news or our Just Three Things emails, this is a really good time to do that because email is going to be the best way of our communicating with you in the days ahead and also of course through our social media. If you would like to sign up for those, then please send an email to Carrie Mack today. Her email address is carriemack at mumconline.com. Since we're doing everything online today, this is a great time for you to try out and experiment a little bit with electronic giving. You can do that here at Memorial through our Give Plus app. You can download it and set up an account. Or you can go onto our website, mumconline.com forward slash give, and you can follow the links there to be able to do electronic giving. Of course, you can always write a check like the old fashioned way and mail it into the church office this week as well. We appreciate your support in these strange times that we are in, and we thank you that by supporting us, you help us to make deeply rooted disciples of Jesus Christ. As of today, our shared Lenten service with First Presbyterian and St. Peter's Episcopalian Church on Wednesday at noon is going to take place at St. Peter's Episcopalian Church. The weeks thereafter will be called on a week-by-week -week basis. We hope that you can join us there. And on Wednesday night, we have cancelled our Wednesday night dinner, of course, but our sandwich ministry team will come and prepare a meal for our friends and neighbours for whom that time is most important. We may not be able to share the peace of Christ with one another this morning in a physical sense, but there is nothing to stop us sharing the love of Christ with one another. So I encourage you today to maybe pick up the phone or send an email or write a snail mail letter to the church members that you're missing most. That way we reach out to one another and we prove that even though we can't get together on Sunday morning for worship, love still shows up. We are glad that you are here today and we proceed now in worship with Pastor Carrie Uter. At home and in our worship space this morning, we are going to light the light of Christ together. So this is the time to get your candle out and your matches and let us welcome Christ's light into our space. Thank you. 
Let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us, let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. Jeannie and Joy will now lead us in worship through song. We invite you to sing along. We don't know what the future holds, and each day we seem to face decisions with insufficient information. And we don't always know what's going to be best for our family, for our neighbors, or for ourselves. And so when we don't know what to do, we turn over our hands and our hearts to you in prayer. We pray for the leaders of our governments, for public health officials, and all those working to make decisions that will help limit the impact of this virus. We pray that you would give them wisdom and discernment to do their work to protect the vulnerable and to care for those at greatest risk. 
God, we do pray for those who are sick, those who are at higher risk, those who are struggling with a complicated health condition. God, we pray that you bring your healing where possible, bring your comfort where needed, but most importantly, God, we pray you would bring your presence through it all so that they and we would know that you are with us. God, we pray for those who find themselves isolated, those who are nervous about being infected, those feeling disconnected from family and friends. Give them a sense of your presence and a light of your hope. Help them to feel their community even when it is not visibly present. God, we pray for those who are suffering from the fallout of this virus. We pray for those who are out of work, those whose income is tight, those who are not sure about the economic impact on their families. God, open up the generosity of your people so that ends are met, needs are filled, and suffering is alleviated. Lord God, you created the universe from nothing. You crafted our bodies to fight disease. You inspired doctors, technicians, nurses, and scientists to assist our bodies when they fall short in that fight. And God, you are not done creating or healing yet. So God, give us wisdom to make decisions that will keep ourselves and others safe and healthy. Give us patience to withstand the challenges and inconveniences of this season. And give us hearts that find rest in your faithfulness and confidence that in this time of insecurity and fear, you are with us so that we may be agents of calm in the chaos of our world. God, we join these prayers together in one voice from our various places as we pray the prayer your Son taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 4, verses 5 to 42. Hear now the word of the Lord. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, Near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph, Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. And a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For you see, his disciples had gone to the city to buy food. And the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask me for a drink, a woman of Samaria? For you see, Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying it to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you the living water. And the woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket and the water in the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us the well? And with his sons who, and his flocks that drank from it, Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty again. The water that I give them is the, from the spring of water gushing up of eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty again. Or have to keep coming here to draw water. And Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come back. And the woman answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband. For you have five husbands. And the one that you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. And the woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors, ancestors worshipped on this mountain. But you say the place where the people must worship is in Jerusalem. And Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know, and we worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is the Spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, 
who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. And Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then the disciples came, and they were astonished at what he was speaking, that he was speaking with a woman. But no one said, what do you want? Or why are you speaking to her? Then the woman left her jar of water and went back to the city. And she said to the people, come and see a man who has told me everything that I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? And they left the city and were on their way to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Surely no one has brought him something to eat. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me, and to complete his work. Do you not say four months more, then comes the harvest? But I tell you, look around and see how the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life, so that the sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you do not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I have ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days, and many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you have said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. There are many things that they do not teach you in seminary when you're learning to be a pastor or a church leader. How to lead a community of faith through a time of worldwide pandemic or public health crisis is definitely one of those things. But then they don't teach many of us those kinds of things, do they? We're all learning this as we go along and we are learning new things as we go along. We're learning that we will panic by just about anything at just the right time, even toilet roll. <laughs> we are learning how to engage in good hand washing, although that we had not learned that already was somewhat alarming to me. <laughs> We're learning that there are things that you can sing to yourself as you wash your hands to ensure that you have washed your hands for long enough. You can sing happy birthday twice through. You can sing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, you can sing Baby Shark, Sweet Caroline by Neil Diamond, Jolene by Dolly Parton. Or, if you're a Christian, you can use your hand washing moment as a devotional time. You can say the Lord's Prayer. You can sing through a few verses of Amazing Grace. You can recite the 23rd Psalm. And we're picking up some new language as we navigate this new territory together. I'm sure and I hope that you all know what is meant by the phrase flattening the curve these days. It refers to our collective efforts to lessen the intensity of impact of the COVID-19 virus by taking measures that will slow down the spread of the virus. So hand washing is a means by which we are flattening the curve. Another means by which we are trying to flatten the curve is by engaging in more and more social distancing. Gatherings of all sizes, ranging from the rather small to the very large, have been encouraged to cancel or postpone to lessen the potential spread of this virus. Social distancing is what we are engaging in here this morning by engaging in virtual worship. Live streaming our church service to friends and family all over the world as they sit in the comfort of their own homes. Social distancing is essentially the art of isolating ourselves from, from one another for the greater good. And it is very important in times like this. Important enough to cancel school. Important enough to cancel large events like March Madness. Important enough to cancel church gatherings. But we should not be fooled into thinking that social distancing is something new to us. Actually, it's something that we practice, albeit on a much smaller scale, 
all the time in our world. Introverts all over the world have been saying this week that they were created for such a time as this because it has become cool and permissible to withdraw from social contact and to disengage. It's like heaven for them. We also intentionally create forms of social distancing based on things such as class or gender or race or belief system or even things as important as what college football team you support. <laughs> whether we create our own social distance from each other or whether social distancing is imposed upon us for one reason or another, we should not be fooled into thinking that this is something new. This is something that's been around for a long time. And if we look carefully at our gospel passage today, I think we'll see that there's some social distancing going on in there. Jesus is on his way from Judea to Galilee. Now normally when a Jew like Jesus was making that journey, he would make sure that he traveled around the region called Samaria to make sure that he did not come into contact with a Samaritan. Some social distancing, of course. You see, Jews and Samaritans did not get on at all. The Samaritans were a religious sect who had their own virgin version of the faith. Then that rejected some of the central tenets of the ancient Jewish faith. So plainly speaking, the Jews regarded Samaritans as ignorant, superstitious, outside of God's favor and consideration, and they chose not to associate with them. But Jesus did not take that longer route. In fact, the Gospel writer John says that Jesus had to go through Samaria. He came to a city called Sychar. He was tired from his journey and he came to Jacob's well where he sat down for a rest. And into the scene walks this unnamed Samaritan woman to draw some water from the well. Now there's a lot wrong with this picture as I've been explaining. If there was ever a time in history when social distancing should have been in play, this was it. <laughs> A man and a woman, unmarried, should not have been in such close quarters to each other. A Jew and a Samaritan, they should not have been in such close quarters to each other. These two should not have been in the same place at the same time, and if somehow they did, they should not have had a conversation. But Jesus walked right through all of those norms. Give me a drink, he says. And this starts the most amazing conversation between Jesus and this woman at the well. It's a conversation that highlights the social distancing that should have been in place. What's the next thing that she says to him? How is it that you, a Jew, invite me, a woman of Samaria, to give you a drink? For Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. It's also a conversation about living water. Jesus is stating clearly that this woman should be asking him for a drink because he's the one that can give her living water. Water that if she is to drink of it will ensure that she never thirsts again. Jesus knows that this woman thirsts for something more in life. She is alone at the well in the midday sun. Perhaps she is socially distancing herself from the others of her own accord. Or perhaps some social distancing has been enforced upon her through the rejection of the others in her village. Whatever the reason is, this woman is at the well in the midday sun and Jesus recognizes in her a thirst for something more. This living water that Jesus offers will become a spring in the soul of the one who drinks of it. And it will gush up into a spring of eternal life, he says. Well, the woman confesses her thirst and asks Jesus for some of this water to drink. And then from nowhere, Jesus changes the direction of the conversation. Go and bring your husband back with you. Oh, sir, she says, I don't have a husband. To which Jesus replies saying, you know what, you tell the truth because you have actually had five husbands and the one that you are with now is not your husband. Well, this is where the woman really starts to recognize that she's having a conversation with someone who knows a thing or two. 
So she decides to ask some deep questions of this prophet that she has happened upon in the midday sun. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you and the Jewish people say that we must worship in Jerusalem. She's asking which one he thinks is right in all of this. Jesus responds in a way that might have surprised the woman. He acknowledges the worship habits of the Samaritans. He does the same of his own people, the Jews. And then he says uh, something that will surprise her. He says that a day is coming when worshippers will neither worship on this mountain or that, but true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For that is the kind of worship that the Father seeks. Sir, she says, I know that the Messiah is coming, and when he does, he will explain all of these things to us. Jesus says to her, I am he, the one to whom you are speaking. The conversation is then interrupted by the returning disciples, and the woman leaves in haste, leaving her water jar behind her. She rushes back to the village where she starts to tell people about this person who knew everything about her. She invites them to come and to listen to Jesus, and as they do, they come, and having gone based on her testimony, they listen to Jesus for themselves, and they believe based on their own experience. It really is an amazing conversation. That the social boundaries have been broken down. That the social distancing has been overcome by Jesus. It's rather remarkable. This is actually a conversation that is oozing with good news. And it is not insignificant that this conversation is recorded by John, the Gospel writer, immediately after another conversation that Jesus had had. That's right in John chapter 3. It's a conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. The very conversation we talked about in church last week. These are two conversations with two people that really could not have been more different. Nicodemus, a man. A man who is given the dignity of being given his name in the record as John takes it down. An educated man. A Pharisee of upright standing in his community. A member of the local ruling council. In talking to this guy, Jesus is having a conversation with a well-known, well-respected, well-connected leading voice in the community. This woman, on the other hand, well, she's not even given the dignity of being given a name in the record. She is a nameless woman. She is a Samaritan woman. Her family relationships and her story seem to be utterly complex. She is one with whom, for whatever reason, a social distance has been created and enforced. Nicodemus came under the cover of night. This nameless woman meets with Jesus in the light of the midday sun. Nicodemus and this nameless woman could not be any more different. Their situations could not be any more different. The seeming importance and significance of their lives could not be more different. The levels of their education could not be more contrasting. And yet, they both see Jesus. And they both recognize the importance of listening to him. And perhaps even more significantly, Jesus sees them just as they are and treats them with equal value and worth and dignity and shares with them the eternal truths of the good news. That God loves the world and everyone in it with an unconditional and an unshakable love. That anyone, anyone can be born anew from above, can turn the page and can start writing a new chapter of their lives along with God. That everyone, regardless of social distancing, regardless of how we try to classify one another in the world and one another's worth in the world, that everyone is of equal worth in God's eyes. That in Christ who shows no partiality, we can all of us draw from and drink from the deep wells of living water. In fact, the deepest well of living water. 
And so I make an invitation to you this Lent. As we find ourselves in all sorts of fasts and disciplines, those that we have chosen and begun on Ash Wednesday this year, those that have been enforced on us somewhat by our current circumstances, as we find ourselves socially distanced from one another in the short term and for the greater good, as we find ourselves right here, right now, in this moment, may we find Jesus here with us. Right there with you. As you engage with this worship service at home via a screen. May you find Jesus with you in this moment. And may you know beyond doubt and within the depths of your own being that Jesus finds you very much important enough to be with in this moment. There's no social distancing that can keep Christ far off. He is here with us all, wherever we are in this moment right now. So why don't you take a moment with him? In a few seconds, Max and Holly are going to play a musical selection for us that will close out our online worship service. And as you listen to it, perhaps you will take some time to connect with Christ in a new way. Perhaps you will take a drink of the living water that will ultimately gush up within you into a spring of everlasting life. If that's what you want today, if that's what you need today, right now, in this moment, then I encourage you to listen to what's coming next and to hold out your hands just in front of you wherever you are and to receive all of the good news that Christ offers us in this moment. So I invite you to close your eyes just now and to listen and to take that moment as we respond to this word together. We want to thank you for joining us for our online worship service this morning. 
We do want to remind you before we depart with the benediction, uh, if you can find our attendance document and just let us know that you joined with us this morning. I also invite you to share widely, as widely as possible, the video of our worship this morning. It will remain on Memorial's Facebook page. It will also go to our YouTube page just after this service. The other thing that I want to remind you of is the images, devotionals that we are using throughout Lent. Of course, you haven't been at church this morning and it hasn't been put into your hand, but we will email this document out with our Just Three Things email going later on today. And so thank you for joining us in worship today and we depart now with a blessing the lord bless you and keep you the lord make his face to shine upon you the lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace in the name of the father and the son and the holy spirit amen, amen.